So uh, thanks again, uh, dear panelists, uh, for having joined us. And uh, I would like to ask you, Brigadier Sharma, uh, to maybe kick off the session. Uh, why? Because I think you have a very unique uh, contribution you can bring to this session. You have been actively involved in the making of, uh, of DPP on, uh, on government side. You're deeply involved now also in the private sector, so I think you see both sides. And maybe you can give us your perspective on uh, what is DPP and what will DPP bring. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members on the panel here. As I've been introduced, I have been in the service for 36 years. I was very fortunate to be involved in, I had two tenures in the weapons and equipment and in two project management organizations, and I retired from the Army Center for Electromagnetics where we evaluated all the systems being introduced into the service for the Army as well as for the Air Force. So I have, uh, you know, uh, in-depth, I will say, long knowledge on how this whole process of DPP and, uh, you know, the, the issue of self-reliance uh, coming about. I won't take you to history where, you know, we were caught with our pants down in the 62 war and, and Pakistan thought that uh, 65, you know, we still had our pants down. And then coming up to 71 and the Kargil operations. But the fact is that war is today no more at the border. We are in conflict today with Pakistan, not at the border. We are with, in conflict in JNK, we are in conflict in, in Bombay, in various places inside the country. And therefore, this concept of warfare, the traditional concept of warfare, is uh, no more sacrosanct. And you have to be, to, today the army is not involved in uh, fighting on the border. You are involved in fighting inside the country. You don't know who the enemy is. That is the situation today. Any military goods that you, that you procure are going to be, are probably going to see action by the time they're obsolete. You have to take that into account. You had you know, we said that uh, warfare, you know, you, even your vehicles, the vehicles in the front had to be petrol because uh, the diesel vehicles won't start immediately. All that has changed. Technology has changed everything. Today, you can, even commercial products can be effectively used in, on the border in the field. So all this has gone into making of the defense procurement policies, procedures, and the outlook, if I may say so. Now, the first, again, uh, Cargill was a watershed where we realized that the system of the ordnance factories and the DPSUs producing defense goods was not good enough. And the private sector did not have enough volumes. So the Kelkar committee, it set about that it, defense production has to be privatized. And there has to be, you have to permit export. And that is the, this happened in uh, 2001. And that is when the defense production was open to private sector. It's been 15 years, but today you look back as to who were the people involved in defense production, were the partners, the you know, suppliers to the OFB, to the DRDO, to the public sector, the defense public sectors, they were the ones involved in defense production and they are the ones who have you know, grown, not uh, tremendously, grown marginally because of various shortcomings in the procedures, which with every successive DPP, you try to, you know, solve some problems and maybe you create some more problems. 
I will, uh, since uh, there will be nobody else talking about the uh, defense procurement procedures, I will briefly uh, cover as to what the DPP 2016 has brought about and uh, try and, uh, you know, justify a little bit as to why it was required. Firstly, you know that the categorizations now, firstly you have a make in two parts, make one and make two. In, uh, I, I will describe this later. Then you have the by IDDM, Indigenous Design Development and Design Developed and Manufactured in India, indigenously. Then you have by India. In by Indian, you need, it was 30% earlier, now it's become 40%. Then you have buy and make Indian, there where you buy something ready and the rest is made and the, what you buy can be sourced from abroad. You have buy and make. The difference between buy and make Indian and buy and uh, make is that uh, buy and make Indian, only Indian companies get the RFP and in buy and make the RFP is global. Then you have buy global, in which case you have offsets. It was earlier, three th uh, the offsets were th minimum 30% on uh, indicated cost beyond 300 crores. Now it is indicated cost above 2000 crores. Now, it's indicated cost. What is uh, actually the cost doesn't matter because in that budgeting initially, if they thought that it will be 2,000 crores, then offsets will be uh, there. But the most important issue of, you know, most of the procurements in defense are by category. By Indian, by global, and now by IDDM. And by assumes that everything is available off the shelf and you buy. You can buy rifles, you can see the rifles all over the world and select one, buy one. You can do things which are ready-made available, some type of missiles and so on. But most of the RFPs, if you see, they are not readily available. Why aren't they readily available? Because when, you, when we make the services qualitative requirements, they call it SQR, you pick up the best parameters from various things and you club them together and you have a product which actually doesn't exist. And uh, then you, the people who are competing to supply that, so they need to get things together in that form. And that has been corrected this time in giving you the SQRs in param essential parameters A and essential parameters B. Essential parameters A is what exists on the ground now. You say, I will evaluate you for this, but you will give me an undertaking that you will modify it to meet my particular requirements in the essential parameters B. And you also added to that, that there are enhanced parameters that if you meet this, then you can get a price advantage that, you know, you could be uh, depending on all the factors and 3% per factor totaled up to 10% your, your value would be, you know, uh, you'll be brought down in your, uh, in whatever you've quoted to compete on the L1 basis. So you brought in some amount of higher technical requirements with a little extra cost. Enhanced performance parameter, that's what the exact name they put in the DPP. Okay. So, now in the IDDM, there are two categories, is IDDM 1 and 2, where you say in the one is that the product is designed in India. In which case, you can have only 40% Indian content, or the product may be designed elsewhere, in which case you will need 60% Indian content for it to qualify in IDDM. Mostly, IDDM will, will be preceded by make one or make two. The make one and make two, make one is where the government will fund 90% of the cost to the selected, you know, you select two people to make a product. And these are essentially replacements for, uh, for import. And you need somebody in India to make it, nobody is willing to make it. You say government says, okay, you take on, you will be assured of an order, 90% of the cost of your development we will give to you. And in make two is I go to the government and I say I've got a product which I think you will need 
and they say, okay, this is very good, you make it at your cost, but we, if they find it useful, they say, okay, we'll give you an order. We assure you of an order, and if we don't give you an order, then we'll compensate for, the, for your development cost. These are the two, make one and make two. And in the buy and make Indian, now uh, the uh, Indian content has been increased to 50%. I think that's about uh, all that uh, I need to tell you about the DPP. And there are uh, provisions for the MSMEs. Now, this is uh, grossly misunderstood. Nowhere is the government saying we want to buy from MSMEs. But they've given MSMEs some multiplication, you know, some advantages because they feel that technology has to grow from these small companies. And these companies have inherently been involved in supplying to DRDO, supplying to DPSUs, etc. And the projects in the make one subcategory, not exceeding 10,000, uh, not exceeding 10 crores, will be earmarked for MSMEs. Not exceeding 10 crores. So projects which don't exceed 10 crores, I, I think that's a fair thing to give to a smaller company. Bigger companies may not be interested. And similarly in the make two, not exceeding 3 crores to be given to MSMEs. But the fact is that here is in the make two, uh, firstly, uh, you know, I, I like to boast a little bit because uh, I am a 10th class pass who joined the army after uh, joining the NDA in 1966, I went to NDA and I have been brought up by the forge. I, they made me, you know, trained me in NDA, IMA, degree engineering course, M.Tech in IIT Bombay and MBA. All this has been done by the government. I am uh, uh, brought up by the government of India, uh, the army. My father spent very little on me. And, and I, even in my own company, Axis Cadis, you know, we are doing defense projects and we're doing engineering uh, projects. I uh, speak, even within my own uh, higher management, I speak for the country and not necessarily for business. And uh, I have, right along, since I was involved in procurement, even while in service, in all the DPPs, wherever I have found that there are things for improvement, I have been writing letters to the Raksha Mantri. And every new Raksha Mantri came, I sent him copies of the previous letters that are written to the previous Raksha Mantri. And I had a meeting with uh, the Raksha Mantri on the 1st of July, very recently. And then he said, he said, I need to talk to you for a longer period. And he came here on the 7th to Bangalore and I had a meeting, unscheduled meeting for one hour with him. He said, I mean, so, and where we discussed the shortcomings of the DPP and things like that. The major, now I'm speaking for the industry now. Because, uh, you know, while I, to the industry, I speak for the government, but to the government, I speak for the industry. And what are the shortcomings in the defense procurement today? Firstly, is the cost of NCNC trials. Ten companies participate in a tender. You are made to make new things. You spend a lot of money, only one gets selected if that thing goes through. And the other nine have wasted their money in developing new things and, and they probably uh, develop a junkyard with all the projects that they have developed and then uh, junked because they haven't won the uh, bid. And in some cases, even after winning a project, the project gets shelved. Project gets shelved for many reasons. There are some shortcomings in the RFP itself, in the services uh, requirement, because they've not uh, spelt it out. And since you're L1, you will not do anything extra. I'll give you an example. There's a container project, CCOC, uh, the CCOC, uh, that's the caravan come office container, where they said JAX should be provided for mounting, dismounting of the container from the vehicles, it should be able to lift the container 200 mm above the uh, platform vehicle to allow the vehicle to go out. But the fact is when the vehicle goes out, where is this 
shelter going to be? Where is this container going to be? Is it going to be hanging on the uh, jacks? Or are you going to bring it to the ground? But not spelt bringing it to the ground. So nobody has given them provision to bring it to the ground. So they've catered for 200 mm to raise it 200 mm. And now it keeps hanging in the air on those two jacks, on the, uh, on the jacks. And you can't operate because it, it says the jacks are only for mounting, dismounting. And you can't bring it to the ground. So there's a shortcoming in the RFP. And the RFP could not be changed. Once the RFP is issued, the DPP says RFP cannot be changed. When it cannot be changed, you point this out in the pre-bid meeting, you say that these are shortcomings in the RFP, but they can't change them. When they can't change them, they say, no, no, go through, we will see, etc. But you see, the people who are addressing your questions in the pre-bid meeting and the people who are evaluating you are different set of people. And today, the, you know, the uh, competition for higher ranks, because you know, uh, successively the higher ranks are uh, a very low percentage of the people competing for the higher ranks, then nobody wants to take a chance. I mean, nobody wants to take a chance. They say, we'll go by the word what is written in the RFP. And uh, finally, the project fails. I took seven RFPs where our company has competed, qualified in the trials, and the RFP has been withdrawn. In two of them, after we were L1. RFP, I tell him, I please tell me, I spent 40 crores on this, where do I go? So he agreed with me. He says, all right, we will allow RFPs to be amended at the pre-bid meet, meeting stage. And provided at least three vendors agree to the change. Because, you know, why it couldn't be changed is so that, you know, one vendor cannot influence uh, change in the RFP. So he said, no, provided three people agree. And that is going to come out in the policy letter now. But that is why the DPPs are getting changed. You know, why the, you got DPPs 2011, 2000, you know, uh, 2006, 5, 6, 8, 9, 11, and so on. That's, then when you go through the, you know, go through the trials, the RFP, there is a DGQ8, you know, evaluation. The, you have gone as per what is mentioned in the RFP. But the DGQA have not reoriented their procedures to accepting something that is not mill standard. They will evaluate you for mill standard. And they'll say, okay, you're not meeting this requirement, you're not meeting that requirement. It's, it is, you know, projects become delayed, this thing, and you have to keep justifying is not mentioned in the RFP and so on. This carries on. I think I've exceeded my time. But the fact is that the present government, or at least the Minister of Defence, is willing to listen. As I told you, that I've been writing letters, you know, from 2006 onwards, when Pranam Mukherjee was the Raksha Mantri. And, uh, but the first time that I've been called was with the, in the current government, Mr. Manohar Parikar, he called me, he spoke to me, he said, I need to speak to you for a longer time, he spoke to me for a longer time, and he says, be available, I'll keep calling you. So the fact is that there is somebody willing to listen, and I think all of us, whoever feel there is a shortcoming, should not hesitate to write. Write to the uh, Raksha Mantri directly. He, he reads the letters. I think I'll answer the questions that they come along. I will uh, finish here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.